Okay, welcome back, and let's go ahead and get started with session 14 of 120B to 20B. Today, we are going to really focus all of our attention just on HVAC systems, and specifically, you know, how we go through and model different sorts of cases to uh, actually reflect what you may have in your building, and there's really an awful lot of different options. A lot of what we're going to do is very simple. It's uh, just kind of tying things together and trying to get the geometry to join together, and Again, where we have any troubles with this um, is typically uh, just in making the physical connections, just spatially making all the connections work. Uh, Revit template, the default mechanical template, has an awful lot of different sizes of ducts and types of connections loaded into it. And the important thing is that for Revit to make the connections, it needs to find what it needs. If it can't find what it needs, then it just sort of says, oops, no auto route solution is found. And usually when that happens, it'll be that there's just some sort of thing about your geometry that's gonna make it very hard to join. Sometimes it's that things are a little bit too close to each other so that there's not room to put in all the necessary transitions and connecting elements. So a good strategy is to back off a little bit. Sometimes it's just that you're coming in at a slightly, you know, just a slight angle. You know, if you come in and you're not dead on, you're two degrees off, there's actually a complicated connection to make in there. So a lot of times we spend our time just either aligning things or making sure things are lined up perfectly perpendicularly, just because that will all make the connections go a little bit better. But in principle, what we're doing is fairly straightforward. It all just really gets down to there's a lot of hassles in terms of trying to get all the pieces to connect, is given your spatial geometry. So we'll look at some strategies for how to work around that. Okay, in terms of where we are on the overall project, this should be the week that you're thinking about your HVAC systems, and if you're still finishing up your structure, that's okay. Just as we meet, we'll start to kind of map out together a little about where the HVAC systems may be, kind of where the air handlers might be and where some of the main duct runs might be. Or even more importantly, just what your overall strategy is. Are you using air to just ventilate, or are you also using it to heat and cool, or are you gonna be using a different strategy for heating and cooling, like radiant floors or uh, some sort of a local system that's room by room? Here in the U.S., we tend to use systems that blow a lot of air around a lot. That was sort of a very common way of doing things. Um, not as much now, because we're realizing there's more efficient ways of doing that. If you're from other parts of the world, you're probably used to other types of heating and cooling strategies. For example, in a lot of Asia, there aren't big, large air handlers that blow air from a central location that's heated or cooled. Often, in individual rooms or in zones, there's an air conditioning unit which handles it very close to the endpoint destination, and it's controlled there. So there's split systems. There's also the systems we'll talk about. But for right now, just be thinking at a high level about your HVAC strategy, so we can start implementing it. In terms of thinking about the strategy, I want to go ahead and just share some pictures with you, because yeah, I really do go by this notion of like observing everything around you. You'll be amazed at how much stuff, yeah, that is actually very informative when you start taking it all apart, um, is occurring in the building right around us. Y2E2 well, is actually a very complex building. There's some very sophisticated systems happening that are at work here, and it's, just, it's fun to kind of look at them. But even as you're just like, you know, at the mall, at a restaurant, anywhere, just pay, start paying attention to things that are happening around you and you'll actually start to see examples of the systems that we're talking about, which could help inform and uh, kind of influence you. So let me go ahead, I'm gonna actually just open up some examples of some photos. Just that I collected, oh, whenever I go out and kind of hang out in spaces, especially new spaces, I'll often see photos that really uh, just kind of get me, uh, or photo opportunities that give me an opportunity to go through and illustrate something you wanna talk about during class. This, this for example, is a photo of a restaurant that just opened down in Campbell. Um, as you go looking up at it, there's a couple things that are sort of interesting looking up. You sort of see there's some big blue land beads. If people want to look big blue land beads looking like, looking like. These are probably, I would guess, 18 inches deep. That's probably, I would guess that is, it might be three and a half, it might be five and a quarter, or five and an eighth, kind of wide. But basically, it's either a two by six or two by four, kind of all laminated together in multiple layers. So when we talk about glue land beams, it's things like this. You'll see that this glue land beam system is then supplemented by some open web joists, which are hanging on the glue land beams. And those in turn are spaced like every 16 inches or so, and that's supporting the plywood deck above. So, if you wanted to have open web joists or have solid beams in there, either one of those could work. 
open web joists tend to be very light and very inexpensive, and they also offer the advantage of being able to run things through the web. So they're often used commercially because it's really easy to go through and route things. So that's kind of what's going on there. As far as the HVAC system coming out, take a look at this, and you can see it coming out of the wall. This is a round duct. Notice that it's made of like sort of spiral sheet metal that's coming around. As you go moving from this wall surface towards where I'm standing in the photo, you'll see a number of different caps that are then shooting air down into the space. Okay, so my speculation is that this is a supply air duct and it's shooting kind of fresh air down into the restaurant and kind of it's going to ultimately going to be collected somewhere else. But notice also as this duct kind of runs along, I'm not sure if you can see there's one transition right here, there's a second one right here. It's getting a little narrower as we go. And the reason is, you might suspect, after every pair of taps drops off, as we move more and more air out of the duct, there's less air flowing downstream. So as we keep on going downstream, it's getting smaller because the amount of volume is getting smaller. So just little simple things to look at. Let me kind of show you just a couple more in this uh, area. Let me do it this way. Okay, it's where we were. There is the end of the duct. You see it actually just comes on out. There's a couple of uh, air terminals right towards the end, and then it's capped at the end, so the air is flowing straight up. These are what I would call like taps. Those are just tapped right into the side of the duct. Not much else there. There's just a straighter run coming on down here. That's one coming from the other side, but um, it's basically the same sort of system. They seem to be running just a lot of air in through those ducts and kind of supplying that way. It's interesting, I don't yet see any returns. Let me go back and see if I can spot any returns in this system. Gotta look for the returns. They often show up in funny places. I'll show you another set that actually, where they're a little more obvious where the returns are. I don't see where the returns are. I see sprinklers. I can actually see some sort of sprinkler piping actually running right through here. Who's it underfloor? It could be. It's a slab, though. I don't know. It's hiding somewhere, probably, but you know, you know that air is returning somewhere. You know it is. You can get that white thing, and you can't see the top of it. The white thing to the left. Yeah. You see here? Yeah. That's like a soffit. It could be in there. That's a very common thing that we'd have a return somewhere towards the center, kind of pulling in. At the bottom, right? Where is it? Oh, what's that thing? Actually, that's actually a Coke machine. <laughs> I don't know. We spend some time, we'll figure it out. Here's another restaurant. Seems like I spend all my time in restaurants. That's where you sit there and look, and look up at the ceiling as you're waiting for things. Uh, this is a place called Armadillo Willies. Perhaps you're familiar with it. Uh, this is the one down near my home. You again have a series of supply ducts coming out. It's a little bit different. Big round ducts with the taps coming right off the sides. Notice the ducts aren't getting smaller. Okay, which is kind of interesting. That means that actually the pressure is dropping a little bit as we go through because the volume is dropping. So, you know, as the pressure is higher up here than it is over there, just because the volume is dropping as we come out, you have the supply ducts again coming into the restaurant. Sort of a very common scheme. In fact, what's sort of in common between these two different schemes is you'll notice that in both these schemes there's no ceiling. Everything's just all exposed. And if you're going to leave everything all exposed, it's very common to use round ducts just because they're considered to be a little bit better looking than the square ducts. So if you're going to not have a ceiling, round ducts are often sort of a good thing to go with. Um, round ducts tend to be a little bit more expensive per lineal foot than square ducts or rectangular ducts. So there's a trade-off in there. So I have my round ducts coming off here. <coughs> Can you spot the returns wow. in this photo? So supplies coming out here. These are actually returns back towards the center. So that's pulling back in towards the air handler. So what's happening is, again, we're sort of bringing the fresh air out into the space, kind of like a past air where everyone's seating. All the exhaust air is coming back up and being fed back into these returns on the wall. So if I had to guesstimate, the air handler is probably right up on top of the kitchen. Here's kind of an odd case. This is another sort of air handler sort of dropping on down. 
This is kind of an interesting one. It's sort of the other side of the restaurant. It looks like there's a duct coming down and some supplies coming off of it. Right next to it, there's a duct just kind of pointing straight up. So I think there's a second air handler in this area. There's probably two different spaces at one point. So there's two different air handlers in there. In this case, they brought it down and feeding the supply with the returns just right next to it. That's still kind of okay, although you still want to watch out for this. That's a little bit close to each other. At least this is blowing sideways and this is pulling up. If you have a return and a uh, uh, supply just right next to each other, you may not get very good air mixing action through the space. It just all happen locally. Okay. This is one. It's kind of a fun restaurant that's up in San Carlos. It has a very interesting ceiling here, and can you spot the HVAC system in this picture? Besides the fact that the doors are opening, so I get some natural ventilation there. On the, the running along in the ceiling, along the window line. You are absolutely correct. It is right down here. This is linear diffuser, it's a little slot diffusers. So if you look at that, there's really not very much area per foot. You know, so you need a lot of footage to do that. But it makes for sort of a very even sort of distribution system. That's very nice architecturally. So this is kind of cool. They have a sort of slotted ceiling. They have little air diffuser slots right there. It just blends in very nice architecturally. So there's a lot of ways you can do that. Just, you know, different strategies. Notice even here, when those windows aren't open, when those doors aren't open, Okay. Air is technically supplied over here. It's coming on down past the glass, which is going to be hot or cold, probably the opposite of whatever we want. And then it's going to be exhausted back up to the center somewhere. So just be looking around at things. A couple more random things. This is a tiny little, uh, oh, this is a package unit up on the roof of that restaurant. So this is what's actually up on top of everything. You have a big old kind of steel box. It has several different components to it. I'm not sure if you can see, it's actually broken up into chambers. We have this thing, looks like a, like a little fan on the one side of it. That's actually, that's the air conditioning condenser unit. So if you have had air conditioning outside your home, you're probably used to seeing one of those things sitting outside. Yeah, pretty much wherever we go in the world, you have things like that, either on a shelf outside the apartment, or sitting on the ground outside, or sometimes they're up on the roof. But basically we have a series of fins in there, and. You run coolant past there, and the air kind of blows past the fins and like kind of cools that down and kind of blows that through, so you don't want to block the fan. Okay. This thing that's hanging out over here on the side where the little rag is sitting on top, I believe is actually the air intake for the replacement air, for the fresh air that's coming in. So I think this is going to have some recirculated air coming up from the restaurant, be mixed with some of the outside air, then either heated or chilled, and then go blowing back down into the restaurant. And that's the basic anatomy of an air handling unit. So here it is just from another side. You sort of see that little cooler on the side. As I move around, you can start to see it has all sorts of funny connections to it. It looks like this is an electrical connection. So that makes sense. There should be electrical equipment right here. It looks like it has a gas connection right here. That's probably because there's a furnace or some sort of heater element that's going to burn the gas. And when heat is necessary, the air that passes through will get heated. I can find uh, on the back side over there. Looks like there's a little water coming out of it. And in terms of that, it looks like it's even uncapped there, which is probably not the greatest thing. But that's probably draining away some water. And what happens often when you're working with a unit like this is um, if you are chilling air to make it acceptable for the inside, if the air has a lot of humidity in it and you get it cooler, water will condense out of it and then like that need to be taken away somewhere. So very often you'll have like these little drip pans and things that take the water out, just so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so I think that's what we're looking at through there. But we're going to look at some rivet models of air handlers and just be looking for things like, oh, it'll typically have a fresh air intake, it'll have the supply air, and then it'll have kind of a return air coming back out. It'll all sort of different units, they're all kind of coming in different parts of the box. One last thing there. I just throw that in. That's a little skylight. For anyone who's still finding with uh, the ocean daylight, you wonder how it in there. And skylights can be all sorts of places. They don't necessarily have to be right on the uh, kind of center of the roof. This is located right up against the wall, and light comes right down on the kind of architectural wall, so it looks pretty good inside. So 
those are just some examples to look at. But just start observing as you go around, even if you go from room to room in this building, see if you can find all the room for that chill beams, these things that are above us, where air is coming in and be heating and cooled that way. See if you can find, there's some classroom that have radiators on the sides. There aren't that many of them, but there are a few, like the rooms, conference rooms, that have radiators on the side walls that are used for heating and cooling. But for the most part, most of what we're having is kind of by the radiant floor system. Okay? And then little supplemental stuff up in the ceiling. If you're up in the I room and you look up, you'll see the VAV boxes. They're all exposed there. So you can sort of see where the air which is blown into those spaces gets the final little bit of heating and cooling and the volume is controlled to kind of uh, ultimately control what the temperature is going to be in the room. Okay. So just pay attention to what's around you. Okay. In terms of what we're looking at today, again, we're looking at sort of ventilating space as well as the thermal copper issues. We're focusing more on the ducting right now, but we're going to get to very quickly the whole issue of the heating and cooling loads and really what's going to be happening there. Ducting and our ventilation is more an issue of how the room is being used as well as kind of the size of the room. So somehow the size and the density of the number of people we assume can be in the room based on its use will give us how much ventilation we need to provide. Thermal comfort is going to vary more on the wall materials, the roof materials, all the thermal properties, as well as your location. So it's interesting that your ventilation requirements would be about the same regardless of where you are in your, but your thermal properties could actually be very, very different. So watch out for that. But in terms of our modeling, the overall approach was Let's go ahead and basically, oh, figure out what our requirements are. So figure out how much ducting or how much CFM we need to go through put in the space, how much air we have to move. Then place some air terminals, connect them together, and ultimately place some equipment together. So that's kind of our general approach. As we keep on modeling, we kind of pay attention to all those different spaces and zones. We actually had to put the spaces together just to even compute the uh, requirements. But then we think about how all the different spaces are zoned together and then really which air handlers or which air handling units actually handle each of the zones. Because in order to uh, have each zone operate independently, and the zone is typically some area that is controlled by its own thermostat or its own set of controls, okay, we need to do things to either sort of split our air handler or have multiple air handlers. Okay, so that's what we're looking at today. So if you can, please go ahead and join me. And we're going to do some modeling together. Yeah. Yay. Off the lobby, stand up, model. <laughs> uh, no? Sure. <laughs> Every single day. Exactly. Models. It's just, it's, it's not even an issue, is it? OK. <laughs> I'm going to go into the, the examples that are in session 13. No, and I'm going to go through and say, let's go ahead and start with uh, 2A. Because that's actually kind of an A-OK -okay place to start. If you go to 2A, that's going to be the space, the space that we've gone through and kind of uh, copied into a mechanical template. Pretty sure I'm a mechanical template here. But we already have some diffusers placed on the ceiling, so we should be ready to go. Let's see what I got here. Okay. I can tell I'm in the mechanical template just because if I look over in the garage browser, you see both architectural views, mechanical views, and plumbing views. That's a pretty good sign that I have a lot of views set up for doing some mechanical work. Let me go ahead and kind of look at this in 3D. There we go. And you'll see so far, what I have is. in this space, a series of different diffusers. Looks like that is actually the architectural model, but it's all kind of grayed out, so I can't touch it right now. Let's go ahead and place some more diffusers. So again, these are diffusers, are terminals. Air terminals is the more proper way to sort of think about them. Are either supply or return, and they're each rated for a certain capacity. So they're all rated for 500 CFM right now, which is a the default amount. Go through and change that a little bit as we try to fine tune our space. But the idea is if you can join me over here, let's go to the easiest thing to do is probably place them on the ceiling. So go to the ceiling plan. 
of level one. And let me see if I can find them. There they are. So you see in the current system, I have, what, eight supplies and eight returns kind of hanging around in here. And these are currently located just eight feet above the ground. If I want to go through and put some more in, what I'm going to do is just go over to systems. And all the things that I can choose over here, air terminals, are right there in the HVAC section. You can choose different types. Again, I'm just going to put these ceiling-based ones in here. Supplies or returns for the 12 by 12 connection. Okay, and I can go dropping them in here. Notice right now you're not seeing anything. That's because the level isn't set to anything. So it's set to level one, so they're down on the floor. If I put them at eight feet, you'll see it'll actually show up there. Now, there's kind of an interesting debate about whether it's better to go through and put them a set level below level two or a set level above level one. You have a choice about how you want to go through and specify that. And if you know that they always want to be eight feet above, but you're not quite sure what your floor to floor height may change to, it's better to reference them off of the level below. If you know that they're always going to have the same sandwich thickness, so that it's always going to be a set number of feet below the level above, you can do it that way. It really doesn't matter. It's just physically you're putting them one way or the other. It's just whichever way you think the things will flex more likely. Will it flex on the bottom or will it flex at the top? So I'll drop some more of those in there. Again, you don't have to drop them in this way. You can go through and just copy them. So if I copy that over. Yes, Lucas, what you got? How many feet vertically do you usually recommend for the mechanical part? Uh, oh, this is a really interesting question. <laughs> yeah, if it's anything less than two feet, things get really tight is really the, uh, the best answer I can give you. So three feet's a much better number to have available to you. Um, and this gets to the whole issue of floor to floor heights because what you gotta do with the whole issue of floor to floor heights is basically allow space for the thickness of the floor itself and the structural elements. And then you have this like under the structural elements, if you can't run the ducts through them, you have the space you have to allow. If it's anything less than two, what happens is a supply and a return, which typically aren't on the same level, they're typically at slightly offset levels so they can pass by each other. If each of those were a minimum of 12 inches, you'd need at least two feet. So if it's less than two feet, things get really squishy. So that's it. Well, another way you can look at that is how much space do you want in your rooms? Like, like standard is, I think, eight feet, feet in the room, and some rooms are like 10 feet and 11 feet. And the higher you have, higher headroom space you have in the room, the better the room feels. Like for instance, this room, it's like really, really tall and you feel like very comfortable. But then again, you have the trade-off between how big your ducts would be. So you have to maybe realize the space you want in your room and then think about the duct spacing. So do the ducts have to be larger if you have a larger space? The thing is you can make your ducts wider and thinner or bigger and so you, there's like a trade-off you have to play with it. So I think the first thing you have to establish is what space you want in your room. That would be where your diffusers would be. So now you have a remaining remainder space. You have to um, calculate how what like where the positions of your duct. Like I guess that feature behind Glenn can give you an idea of. Um, Go for it. So like I was trying to decide what to do in my room. So let's say this was 10 feet, and then let's say you have beams. It was like where do I put my duct? Um, to be exact. And then sometimes, let's say the supply and um, return, you can play with them. Maybe supply is higher, demand is higher. You put them side by side. You don't have to put them directly um, with each other. So you have to play with the heights. So first of all, establish what you want in your rooms, then establish where you want to put the remaining things. You actually asked a real, it's, a, it's an interesting and subtle question about whether the, the amount or the size of the ducts is going to change based on the volume. And the answer is kind of like yes and no, because okay, one criteria will, the other one won't. If you go by air changes, air changes are based on volume. So if I make a bigger room, if I make a room that's 12 feet tall as opposed to 10 feet tall, it actually does have a little bit more volume. So there's a little bit more air transferring through because of that. 
If I look at it in terms of fresh air, that's just really done uh, based on uh, people per square foot. Okay, so that one won't change. But it does have, it's not a huge impact, but it is somewhat of an impact as you get more and more volume. Yeah, you got bigger and bigger ducts. So if this was a two-story sky, it's tall space, it would have bigger ducts than a one-story tall space. Yeah, it's, it's really that issue of the floor sandwich is really one of the hardest things that really kind of haunts any project. It's, it's really where the source of so many different kind of dilemmas come in that you, know, you would like to have the minimum floor to floor height so you could have as much usable square footage as possible. Okay, but uh, the more you squeeze that down, the harder and harder it is for the HVAC to get it, and the plumbing to get its work done in there, and the structural, all those things. So, you know, as you squeeze that, you can make spaces that are actually very expensive to build because there's just no room to kind of get it all in there. So, a very good question. Okay, let me pop another supply duct over here. And if you can, follow along. This is actually easy, and it'll make it much easier for you when it actually uh, comes time for you to do it in your own building. Or you can do it in your own building. I'm just gonna do it in the sample building, because the sample building is so simple, you can't go too far wrong. So in this system so far, I have five, or I basically have three supplies and two returns for each different space. Okay. That might create a little growth problem. Okay. Only in that these are all rated for 500, so I have 1,500 coming in, I have 1,000 going out. So that's a positively pressured room. That's going to have the effect that when you try to open the door, it may be hard to open the door because there's positive pressure. Okay, or if the door opened out, it would blow on out. Like when you don't open the door in the airplane, it's that issue. So we want to keep these things in balance. And we can do that by, we could change the flow for each of those. So I could say if there's 1,500 coming in, then I'm going to still do it with two group terminals but I'm going to do each of them at 750. That would be okay. okay. If you have a terminal that actually is rated to handle 750 CSM. Okay. Or you can go through and put the uh, three in there instead. And we can look online, find all sorts of terminals, and find what they're rated for. But they're all rated a little bit differently. If you had a huge space, you could also go through and arrange these around. Definitely kind of use an array to kind of scatter them around on some even spacing, 10 feet in one direction, 15 feet in another direction, whatever you want. Okay, so once you have all your terminals, or you have your basic layout of the terminals in place, again, the big thing is just really thinking about where the ductwork is going to be. And for the ductwork, we're going to think about its height as well as what its height is. So for that, we'll pop over to ductwork. We'll say, let's go ahead and think about this. The big choices are rectangular versus radius versus oval, or re rectangular versus round versus oval. We also have the issue of are there elbows that are radius or mitered elbows? And again, let's take a look at the difference between those things. If I have a rectangular duct and I say it's going to be radius elbows, let's just sort of experiment with this. I got basically a 12 by 12 duct over here at 9 feet tall. I'm going to spin it over here. Okay. I have some sort of a radius there. Let's see if I can even annotate it and sort of figure out what the radius is. So I got a 12 by 12 duct. It looks like the radius on the inside is one foot, which actually sort of makes sense. So let's try this again a little bit differently just to get a feel for how this all works. Let's go through and I'll go to systems. What if I have, as opposed to a 12 inch duct, what if I have a 24 inch duct? So I'm gonna come down, go 24, see it's much fatter. Come over here. Okay, much bigger radius on it right now. So if I annotate that, Okay, so it looks like the basic rule it's using is that the width of the duct is equal to the radius of the bend. So if we go through and put in things that are very, very tightly bent, and then we go through and increase the ducts, all the elbows are going to get bigger. And that's the part that sometimes gets you in trouble. 
is that the elbows start growing and you just don't allow enough room there. So let me kind of show you an example of where that could happen. For example, if I came through and I said, I'll go back to the 12 by 12s. I'm coming over. I'm going to go up a very small distance <laughs> and then over this way. It's interesting. It's not going to let me do that. It is already not going to let me do that because what it's basically telling me is that it can't make the radius back over here. I'm too tight. Okay. okay. So no worries. I'll stretch that out a little bit further, or what I can do, let me go ahead and draw it. I'll put it over here just a little bit further. You say, is that have enough space to it? We're not really quite sure, but I can trim those together and see. Let me sort of see if I can make this work. I'll say TR trim. And I'll trim this one against that little piece there. Okay, and it looks like it barely works. Okay, so, so far so good. Things are looking pretty good. Until you go through and you resize your ducts. And when you size up the ducts, because uh, you need to figure out how big they'll be to hold the load, I can say, hey, these ducts are now going to be like 24 inches instead. Okay, and we get that sort of problem. And it's only because the radius has got to be. So just let me watch out with this whole issue of the ducts and the radiuses and all that type of stuff. Now, the difference is, let's go ahead and cancel that. Radiuses, again, are very efficient. We like radiuses because air moves smoothly around all those rounded corners. Every time you make air kind of make a sharp turn, it loses energy. Okay, and so you're getting a little bit of inefficiency. If I change those to another category, let me try this. I'm going to choose. Looks like I can't choose them all. I just have to choose the pieces of ductwork. So we get the pieces of ductwork. And I say instead, you're going to be miter elbows. That's interesting. I would expect that it would change them. Maybe not, since it's already there. I'll just do it again. So I'm going to trim. That's a mitered corner. So that's not looking too bad. Of course, it's a little less efficient, but it fits into the space a whole lot better. The trade-off now is if I go through and I change those to the 24s, though, Now, that's an interesting thing. Okay, Revit will do this to you, and it just doesn't make sense. Because you're not going to compress and expand, compress and expand. You aren't going to do that, stuff like that. But it'll try to do that for you. It's kind of dumb in its own way. What I'll do is choose that guy and say that, hey, OK, let's look at your size. It's 12 by 12. I guess I need to make you 24 inches also. And I'll make that 24 also. So again, it's only like half smart about what it's going to do. A lot of times, you'll still have to go through and apply your own kind of uh, intuition and knowledge to go through and fix things up. But again, this actually worked as a series of uh, rectangular or minor corners. It wouldn't have worked as a series of radius elbows. But it's indicative of the big problem we always have is just how to get this stuff to kind of wrap around. So what we were doing and where we finished up yesterday was we ran some big ducks for the air supply, we ran some ducks for the turn or for the return, and we're all going to sort of head toward this middle section. That it was in the middle section, I was going to have some sort of air handler. So what I wanted to do was just basically run some ducks. And if you want to sort of think about running some ducks, you can either run them directly here or you can, well, yeah, I'll just do it here. Let's say 12 by 12, nine feet up. So I'm going to put my supplies out here. to bring it back to the center. Now, you can do this in a number of ways. You know, 
ductwork, like an awful lot of things, can be mirrored. So if you know that your structure is symmetric and you can mirror things around, I can choose these two pieces of ductwork and mirror them around the center line of the building. That'll work fine. So I'll choose that and this one. Get the little corner in there too. And I should tab to get them all. Okay, and now I will mirror actually have a nice center line in the ceiling. That's kind of okay. So use mirroring to your advantage. In fact, I should probably have waited to mirror until after I all put all the little taps on that to kind of connect to the terminals, because then I would get that work too. So let me do that too. I'm going to undo. And I'll do a little more work just to make my kind of eventual work a little bit easier. I'll go through and bring that close. Again, I'm not going to touch it exactly. Oops. Notice it just told me there no auto route solution was found. I came a little bit too close, so it's trying to connect them. And here's the problem it's basically having. It's got a terminal at eight feet that kind of pokes up. It has this two, uh, duct coming in at nine feet. And it's trying to basically put a radius in there. And there's just not enough room for the radius to make it work. So what I'm going to do is undo that and make sure that I have a little length for some flexi duct at the end. The flexi duct can be very, very flexible about kind of working our way around and allowing space. So hang on here. I don't want to get too close. I'll say there. Oh, now that's going to bother me because there's no auto route solution was found. Okay, so I am going to move to another strategy which I use every once in a while, overshoot. So I'm going to pull that out a little further so that I have space to do this. OK, and leave that in there. Now, for these other ones that are kind of coming in here, if I come straight on, it's going to be almost too close. So it's going to, again, try to connect. So I'm going to just go a little bit further. Notice that for these new ones that I'm placing there. It's putting those nice little uh, kind of T's in there automatically. That's actually okay. Again, I'll put a piece of ductwork over here. Looking good. I'll put some over on this side. Now, whether you put them on the left or the right side doesn't really matter. This is kind of all a matter of spatially how you want to get it all in there. Notice as I'm putting them in there, they're also going ahead and they're turning blue to indicate they're part of the supply system. Okay. And finally, one last one. Uh, systems. Right here. Great. Now, the reason for doing all that before we mirror is just that if we go through and do it on one side and we make those six connections, we can make that happen on the other side too. Notice that once they're in place, I can go ahead and choose them and move them around. I can use the arrow keys to kind of shove them around back and forth and it'll try to keep the system whole. So let's just look at this in 3D so you get a sense. Here we have all those guys. Now again, the issue is if I try to connect them in there with a hard connection, just given the heights, there may not be enough room to make the elbows and everything that's necessary to kind of make that happen. Maybe if I do it this way instead, I'll look at it from the right side. You'll sort of see what the difficulty is. See, there's just not enough height there, height difference to go through and kind of make a nice radius connection right there. So what I could do is raise all the ducts upward. That would actually work. If I had a lot of space, I could say, oh, those are going to be at 12 feet. Okay. And now there's enough space, I can probably get the radius in there. So in that case, what I could do is choose this terminal. And what you always say is basically connect into something. So you connect it to a piece of ductwork. So I'm going to connect it to this piece of ductwork. 
Nope, still no auto wrap solution. Still just a little bit too tight. Let me try this. Not that. Let me try taking this duct right here, or this terminal, and say connect into, and just connect it into that pipe. Okay, and there it did it. Now, that actually works. That's a nice, clean connection. It's a very nice, smooth connection. The problem is it's just taking up so much space in the ceiling plane that if you're on the factory floor and you have plenty of room, why not? You know, because even if the factory ceiling is 20 feet high and most people are working down on the you know, lower six feet, you can bring ducts down and kind of really get the air where it's needed down near the floor. So that's okay there. But in spaces where it's tighter, you, know, you just don't have that option. So it worked at 12. Let me choose this. I'll say, how would you be at 11? And at 11, it's probably still OK. How would you be at 10? Getting marginal. Oh, barely. OK, but any lower than 10. We, I think you can see that what's going to happen is we're not going to have any room to make the radius over here. So that's why I went for the other strategy, which is to go through and just take this one out. There's actually even one more little thing there. It's hard to see, but it's a little transition piece or a connector piece there. Okay, and now I can use flexi ducts to connect from here to the end of there. And let's see if it does it. There it does. Tries to represent that. So those are my little flexi ducts. Now the good news about the flexi ducts is they will even run if I lower that a little bit further. So if I run that down to nine feet, it'll still be okay. Now. Watch out for this. You notice the flexi decks disappeared. It didn't give you any error warning, so. What's happening now is it's just having a hard time rendering the flexi ducts. They're sort of so bent or so twisted that it's having a hard time rendering. It doesn't mean they're not there. In fact, if I go to the ceiling plan, you'll see they are still there. Okay, so don't be put off by the fact that your flexi ducts may disappear on you, at least in terms of the rendering. They're still actually there as far as the system is concerned. So I'll just put the last of these in over here. OK, so I got one side looking fantastic. If I would like to go ahead and mirror this and make it happen on the other side, go for it. Now to do that, there's all sorts of different sort of Revit sort of selection tricks that you might use. One way to approach this is you can sort of highlight everything and then use the filter. A lot of you know I like to use the filter where I can sort of say, okay, this is what's selected right now. I have 10 air terminals. Actually, I don't want to repeat the air terminals because I already have air terminals over there. If I hadn't placed them yet, I could copy them. I have duct fittings, ducts, and flexi ducts. And Oh, I definitely want to get ducts and duct fittings. Flexi ducts, you can decide. For flexi ducts, if these terminals over on this side really are exactly at the mirror locations, then they'll connect perfectly. If they're not, all this sort of connected ducts then do the flexi for that last few inches. So let's just do that. I'll say super, I've got those things selected. Let me mirror around the center line. Excellent. And now I'll do a little bit of flexi action on the other side here. So go ahead and see if you can get those in there. If this is all very straightforward and you're working ahead, see if you can go ahead and put some supply side ducts in there too, or some return ducts in there too. So towards those middle ones. So I'll just finish that up. Okay, there's my supply side. It's looking good. Now my supply side 
you'll notice I have these two different legs coming in from other sides of the hallway. If I want to join those together and bring it down as a single piece of pipe towards the center, I can do that. I can do it as two different pieces, but ultimately at the air handle, I have to get it back down to one piece. So what you can do is as follows. If they're really opposite each other, you can just connect them together. It's one of the nice things about ducts is if you actually put them together and they match, they'll heal. So that's just one big duct right now. And then if I put the duct in going in the other direction, if I just tee off of that, let me see if I can get that duct also at nine feet. Just bring it on down the center of the hallway towards that future air handler. Beautiful. Okay, that is a good looking supply air system. So we can do this for it's the same for the return air side. As you look at this system, since all of those are 500s, do the math and you sort of count it up. It's 500, 1500, or 500,000, 1500, 2000, 2500, 3000, 3000 on the other side. By the time it gets here through the middle, that's 6,000. So if I think that it's 1,000 what feet per minute is the limit on the velocity we can put in there, I actually need to get myself six square feet in here. So that could be two by three, or it's, it's quite a large piece of duct. Okay, so if we want to start reflecting that, and it's a good thing to do to reflect that as soon as possible, to you know, we can go through and resize these ducts and have it, you know, it's gonna be a little bit better. Now, Let's think about our strategies in terms of like, uh, well, let's do it this way, we'll think about a new strategy. Okay, so, actually, let me check in with you guys. How are you guys doing in terms of having some basic ducts in place? You doing pretty good? Got some system in there? Okay, if you got a system that's got closed off everywhere, except open on that one end, we're ready to size. So as a precursor for sizing, you might just turn on this thing called the system inspector. And how this works is, I choose one of those ducts and I say system inspector, we can inspect some things. So I'm going to hide around in here. It said, oh, it's about 500 over there, 1,000 over here, 1,500. Coming around the corner. You have some red. I know I have some red. Why do I have some red? Um, pressure loss or pressure gain. Uh, yeah, and somehow the, it's, it's outside the bounds of what's considered to be a good duct. And it's probably just that, uh, yes, it's That's sort of undersized. This is interesting here. Here I got this zero. I'm good up to 2,500 right there. It seems to be having some sort of trouble right there. Oh, I'll tell you why. I did something really dumb right here. Remember when I put that other duck there? There's still that little T still hanging around over there. Yeah, that little T has nothing connected to it, so at that point, like all bets are off because um, it could just be sort of pulling in air. I have one up here too. I have that little leftover T from what I had connected them with radiuses. So let's go ahead and get rid of that. I'll just backspace it. I'll backspace it up here. And the way to fix that is just to join them back together. It'll heal back up. So I'll say here's the one duct. Let's pull it on over. That's looking good. That's all healed up. Let's heal this one up. Looking good. Okay, now our system inspector ought to be do, doing a better job. Let's see about this. So 1,500, 2,000, 2,500. Ah, now we have a red, but the reason we're having the red is that it's 3,000, and 3,000 is again just too much. Over here, you'll see it's even 6,000. Okay, so, yeah, I need some bigger ducts in here. So, let's try resizing these ducts first, just to kind of make them fit. Again, manually, if the limit is 1,000 FPM, you can sort of say that's 6,000. What, if we divided it with uh, 6,000, we divided it by 1,000, we'd actually end up with basically six square feet that would be necessary. But if we want to sort of see that in action, let me go through, again, I'll choose one of the ducts. I have system inspector and I have duct and pipe sizing. Now duct and pipe sizing is kind of interesting. If you say duct and pipe sizing and choose the whole system, it'll choose everything. 
If you do it just with a single piece selected, it'll only uh, size that one piece. So for example, if I come over here and I choose that one, and I say, let's duct and pipe size it based on the 1,000 FPM. Oh, it's upset because the tail end of it's not connected to anything. Let me do it on this one. Hang on, I don't think what's going on. Oh, oh wait, did I undo? What did I do? It goes back again. I must have an undo in here somewhere. Okay, let's try that again. So over here, I'm going to choose that. I'm going to say duct and pipe sizing. Okay, notice it got to be much bigger. It's 30 by 30 right now. And 30 by 30 is okay. Um, so 90 square inches. Um, we wanted six square feet, like 72 inches. It's squaring it out right now. Sorry, the six times 12, yeah. No, 72 times 12, or whatever that is. Um, if we wanted to go through and limit it, we could say, hey, you know, it really wants to be restricted to a height of like 12 inches, and then it'll be very big and flat. I'll resize that. Oh, that did that. So it's a very big piece of duct right now. 72 by 12. Okay. Now, if we follow this through for the entire system, which would be a good thing, you'll see that it's going to be smallest at the ends. It's going to get bigger and bigger as you get back towards the middle. So let's just try that. To get the whole system, I'll just tab a couple times. There, I got the whole system say duct and pipe sizing, and we'll go ahead and do that. Now, I still have that limit of 12 inches, so you're going to see my pipes get very, very wide. If you don't have it set to restrict it to 12, they're going to get squarish. This would be good. Select all the ducts themselves. You can sort of filter to grab all the ducts and then change them to be the other types of ducts. Really? It's still uh, messing them up in terms of the tabs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I just did it with the tabs. Okay. Yeah, so that's just that is interesting. Okay, don't know how to fix that right up here. Whatever. No worries. No. Good question, though. Okay, so you see, my system is actually getting much, much bigger coming all the way through here. And this is one way to lay out a system. Let's talk about other ways we can lay out the system. There's a lot of ways we can lay out the system. This is kind of all that way. It's kind of all facing uh, in this direction. Let's try something. I'm going to undo that and try laying it out a little bit differently. So. If you were trying to imagine the worst case scenario to make this system work, what would be the worst possible routing you could come up with? In terms of like, a, it's almost an unfair way to ask the question. Actually, what, what is it that drives the, like, uh, the ducks to get so big? What, what is it that's really driving us? And what do we need to try to minimize? So yeah, as the ducks come back this way, they get bigger and bigger. We have more and more flow, so they have to get bigger that way. Just about. So let me show you one of the worst possible ways you can go ahead and route this system. 
games. This is the type of thing Alpha Lobby might do. No, Alpha Lobby would tell you not to do this. It's the type of thing I might do. Okay, let's go over here. On the end of this thing. Bring it on down. And bring my duck back to the center here. Okay, my assertion is that this will be a worse layout than the other layout. For sure. Ah! And <laughs> why is it for sure? I have, I have an agreement. Because the hull of the terminals are coming off the same line of ducts. Exactly. So if I go through popping around here, I got the 500, the 1500, 2000, 2100, all the way 3000, 3500, 4000, 4500, 50, 5000, 55, 6000. So by the time it comes around here, things got hawking big. And it's really a so anytime you find yourself running ducks and you end up having like more than five or six terminals kind of hanging off of it, it's a sign that, oh, okay, now this may not be the most efficient way to lay it out. So let's let that finish up. You'll see it just kind of is not a very good way. Just in general, you know, the poor guy down in this office gets the least effect of anything. Okay, so these are getting very large in terms of what's going on. So that's not a great way to run it. <laughs> Okay, so that's not good. Let's go ahead and we'll play with one more and then we'll take a break. In fact, it's even telling us there's one thing where something's running backwards. It's this, back, it's this piece over here. There's something over there that's just running backwards. It's, you can't go through and figure out how to make that transition because that's so huge. Okay, another way to run this, which might be a little bit better, let's think about this. In this layout, we basically have six coming down on each, and then joining together to 12. Yeah. Can you think of a way of laying this out so we can actually get even fewer on each leg? In the middle, having the two main ducks go yeah. up and down. Excellent. So the suggestion is, what if we did this? If we brought it across the middle, And then we took that thing to our hair handler. Might mean our air handler is in a slightly different location. Now I got a little redundancy happening down here at the end, so I'm going to get rid of that. Now these end pieces right now, that's a tap in there right now. What I can do is, that was like a T, I can trim those together and just replace it with more like a tap or a radius. Oops, wrong one. good. This one over here, I'm not sure if that's still just left over from another sort of analysis. I'll just take that one out and replace it with our radius also. A little trim action here. Okay, so as you think about this, it's three, it's three. You do have this length of six, so we're not completely off the hook, but then the 12 is limited to right there. Okay, so that may be a slightly more efficient way to run it. What this is going to mean is the end points of the pipe are actually pretty efficiently laid out. So it's going to be big pipe in the center of the building. It's probably near your mechanical room. Oops, I'm not quite joined over there. I can tell because it didn't sort of highlight. Are you there? Nope, it's still not there. Hang on. See what's going on. You certainly look like you're at the right height. 
You look like you're at the right height. You look like you should join in. Come back up. Pull that back. Still looking funny. I'm gonna look at that in 3D. There's something weird going on. Hmm. Again, very, very weird. So I'm gonna go back and try to join that up. This is kind of just typical of the frustration of trying to run these things sometimes. I'll pull back up here. Let's try this. I'm gonna try using one of my trim tools. One of the trim tools, right, oops, see if I go to modify, here basically extends to sort of tie into other series of elements. So I can say that I want to take that and bring that into it and see if it'll do that. Okay, that time I did it with some surety. It might be somehow confused because I'm just right over this wall and it's having something, some trouble figuring out what I was trying to stick to. But we eventually fought with Revit and got it to do its thing. So, we'll choose all those. We'll duck them. Size them. We'll see how that looks. So the lesson, or the object lesson, this this part right here, is really that based on how you choose to route and group the duct back, you get a very big impact on the size of the pipes. In the end, it really is six feet. There's no way of getting around that. The question is, how long the length is six feet you want? And so this layout is actually, as this is relatively efficient in the scheme of things. Okay, okay. Let's go ahead and take our break. We could go through and route uh, the supply ducts and the return ducts just the same way, but we're going to the next step was we got that giant six foot pipe coming to the hallway. Let's get it tied into an air handler. And that's really where a lot of the, uh, the fun and frustration starts because it's really all just trying to make it uh, work geometrically. Oh, there that is. Go ahead and stop the recording and we'll resume. <laughs>